Okay, so hello everybody, good afternoon. Um, I'm Steve Ferber. Um, those of you who've been around the HBP for a bit may well have met me at one of the previous summits. Um, I'm Professor of Computer Engineering at the University of Manchester, um, a, a situation that I've been in for the last 30 years. Um, and today I'm going to talk about neuromorphic computing in the HBP. Now, quite a lot of this talk will, will focus on details of Svenica, but I will also talk about some general issues relating to neuromorphic computing and uh, mention the other neuromorphic computing system in the HBP, which is the Heidelberg Brain Scales system. So for the last 20 years, I've been leading this project and I've been interested in understanding how computer technology might contribute to the scientific grand challenge of understanding information processing principles that work in the brain. Now, of course, uh, I'm not the first person to be interested in the brain. Um, many people have, have wondered how this organ upon which we all so critically depend functions. Um, and one example uh, that I like because it's linked to the longer history of computing um, is this example from Ada Lovelace. Now, uh, you may have heard Ada's name before. Um, she's well known in computing circles for having worked with Charles Babbage in, uh, in Victorian times in the UK. Babbage built and designed very early mechanical computing systems and Ada thought about the kind of algorithms that such systems might be able to run. In, in some people's minds, she was the world's first computer programmer. But more relevant to this talk, um, she left copious notes and among those notes are her, her thoughts about the brain where she says, I have my hopes of getting cerebral phenomena such that I can put them into mathematical equations. I hope to bequeath to the generations a calculus of the nervous system. Now, <clears throat> that of course was very high ambition um, 200 years ago and even today, um, if you wrote those kind of words into a research proposal, it would probably be automatically thrown out for being hopelessly overambitious uh, because we're still nowhere close to having a calculus of the nervous system. Um, but the idea of, of, of contributing to the quest to find such a calculus um, underpins the research that I've been doing for the last um, 20 years. So coming a little bit closer to date. Um, this is um, a house uh, at the top left of this slide. Uh, I live about 10 miles south of the middle of Manchester where the university is and not far from where I live, about two kilometres away, there's this rather inconspicuous um, house and over the archway to the left where the blue arrow is pointing there is a blue plaque and this is how in the UK we mark um, places where famous people have lived uh, and this plaque says Alan Turing 1912 to 1954 founder of computer science um, lived and died here and indeed this is the house where Turing spent his last uh, few years because he'd come to Manchester to use the first machine that implemented his big idea from the 1930s of the universal computing machine. And while he was in Manchester, uh, Turing worked on a number of topics, uh, but the one that's interesting here is the seminal paper he wrote with the title Computing Machinery and Intelligence. And it opens with the words, I propose to consider the question, can machines think? Now this was two years into the history of the modern computer and, and Turing was already wondering how far this technology might go. And in this paper, um, he thinks that the question, can machines think, is not a very good research question. Um, and he turns it around into a test for human-like intelligence that he called the imitation game, but which of course we simply know as the Turing test for artificial intelligence. And in this paper, he thinks quite a lot about what a machine might need to pass this test, uh, 
and he reckoned all it would need compared with the Manchester machine was more memory. The Manchester machine had 128 bytes of main memory and Turing reckoned that a gigabyte should be enough to pass his test. And he reckoned that by the end of the 20th century, machines might indeed have that much memory, which was a remarkable extrapolation uh, from the evidence available to him, but, and, and remarkably accurate because it was around the turn of the century that a typical desktop PC would have about a gigabyte of main memory. It would also have a processor that was a million times faster than the processor in the Manchester machine, but it would not pass Turing's test. And this would have surprised Turing. Now, my personal view as to why human-like artificial intelligence has proved much harder than Turing and many people since Turing thought it would is because we don't understand natural intelligence, so we don't know quite what it is we're trying to build with artificial intelligence. And natural intelligence is, of course, a product of the brain, and we don't understand the brain. So that's behind the motivation for um, me as a, a computer engineer um, turning my attention towards building machines that might contribute to our understanding of the brain. Now, turning thinking about the brain into specific computer hardware uh, can be traced back to um, this gentleman, Carver Mead, who um, worked at Caltech um, and in the 1980s, uh, he began the field that carries the name of neuromorphic computing. And he was very interested in the analogy between the equations that govern the flow of ions in the ion channels in a biological neuron and the equations that govern the flow of electrons in standard transistors operating in their subthreshold region. The subthreshold region is the region of transistor operation that we digital designers simply call off. So very low current levels. Um, and those equations are essentially the same. And there's good reason uh, why you might expect them to be the same. And, and uh, so he proposed this area of building analog electronic circuits that behaved in ways that emulated the behavior of the biological systems. And, it, and he developed chips that implemented technologies such as, as touch, hearing, and vision. Um, and, and these were well published and, and, and widely read um, in the 1980s. And, and that really laid the foundation for neuromorphic computing. Um, and people still work in this area of analog circuits um, but also the area has diversified um, into purely digital systems, as long as the system has some characteristic which is derived from the brain, um, it can have the handle neuromorphic attached to it. Now, if we look at the history of the Human Brain Project, um, it was motivated by three high level reasons. Um, why should we spend you know, the billion euro uh, flagship project studying the brain. And the three reasons were, uh, first of all, to understand the brain because it remains one of the great mysteries to science. Then the possible benefits include understanding brain diseases, which cost the developed economies uh, an awful lot of money every year. So if by understanding the brain, we could develop better treatments for those diseases, um, that would be very advantageous, both in economic terms and, of course, in terms of the quality of life of those affected and, and those near to them. But also, the third reason was to develop future computing technologies. And computing clearly um, is very important to modern economies, um, but it's approaching some physical limits and some new ideas are required if the kind of growth in computer power that we've seen over the last half century is going to continue um, into the future. And one aspect of developing 
future computing was this idea of neuromorphic computing to develop um, neuromorphic machines, uh, thinking about algorithms and architectures, the theory um, of, of brain that can be applied to neuromorphic computing and applications uh, for the systems that emerge. So in the HBP, there was a computing strategy for neuromorphic systems and this involved two large-scale systems, the digital system developed by my group in Manchester called Spinnaker, where the name is simply a contraction of spiking neural network architecture, and the brain scale system at the University of Dresden, um, which is closer to Carver Mead's original analog approach. So the Spinnaker system um, is based upon a many core architecture and in, in many ways what it implements is simulation similar to the simulation you can run on a conventional computer but the architecture has special features to enable it to support brain-like architectures more efficiently and the brain scale system because it uses analog circuits which um, solve the same equations as the biological systems in the brain is viewed more as an emulation of, of the brain rather than a simulation. Both of these systems existed before the HBP started. Um, they both go back 15, 20 years and within the HBP, uh, second generation versions of these systems have been under development and are now beginning to emerge. And these have been put together in what's called the HBP Neuromorphic Computing Platform, which is part of the eBrains research infrastructure. And both of these systems have been designed and built by their respective teams from the transistor up. So the, the core skill, if you like, in, in both the Manchester and Heidelberg groups um, is the, the design of silicon chips that form the basis of these two machines. Now, of course, they're not the only neuromorphic systems around. Um, there are many others around the world, and a couple of other examples are shown here. Uh, the IBM True North um, is a digital system of about the same vintage as Spinnaker and Brain Scales. And then uh, 10 years later, the Intel Loihi chip um, came onto the scene. And you can think of these different approaches to neuromorphics as being on a sort of linear scale of increasing biological realism from left to right and increasing ease of use from right to left. And, and there are other systems around that would also fit on this scale. And, and really, uh, the question is still open as to which of these represents the optimal approach to neuromorphic computing. Indeed, it may be the case that, that different systems are more suited to different sorts of, of use and application. Um, and uh, as an area of research, uh, they all have a role to play in this development of, of brain-inspired computing. Now, over the 20 years that we've been developing these systems, of course, the outside world hasn't stood still, and there's been this explosion of interest in neural networks in applied artificial intelligence. And I would say that the HBP neuromorphic systems have been developed primarily to contribute to brain science, whereas externally deep neural networks have been developed um, to solve application problems. But there are similarities and differences between these two approaches. Uh, this, this slide shows an archetypal uh, neural network where you input something like an image at the left hand side. This information then passes through many um, neural layers which uh, have a variety of functions and then at the right hand end there's a classification layer um, and the classification layer says the image is a cat I think that's the popular one um, if the classification layer says the image is a dog that's an error and you feed the error back from right to left up the network adjusting potentially millions of parameters until those adjustments cause the network to say Yes, okay, it's a cat. Um, and then you move on to the next image. And uh, in the first instance of this, the Google network that 
uh, became very good at recognizing cats, did so after it had been shown something like 10 million images of cats. Now, I compare this to my two-year-old grandson, who, when he's seen one cat, will reliably recognize cats of all sizes and shapes for the rest of his life. So there's some significant difference between how artificial neural networks learn and how biological brains learn. Now, of course, I know that's not a fair comparison because the Google brain started sort of randomly scrambled, whereas my two-year-old grandson starts with a brain that's had two years to develop quite a sophisticated model of the world into which cats fit rather nicely. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's not an apples with apples comparison, but it is still the case that artificial neural nets seem to take a lot of training and training is a very expensive aspect of developing applications, whereas biological systems seem able to learn from some much smaller data sets. Now, if we look at that network with the simple flow of information from left to right, uh, not all artificial nets are quite so simple. Some now have state holding devices, but if we compare that with the very simple view of the flow of information in a biological network, in this case, it's part of the cortex, then we see a very different picture. So in this abstract model of the cortex, what we see is that inputs don't come in at one place, different sorts of input come in at different levels, and outputs are taken out at different levels as well. And all, um, all through the network, information is flowing back and forth in complex patterns. And um, we don't understand how this network does the job. In fact, we're not even totally sure what the job of the cortex is, except that it does appear to be involved in many of the higher level functions of the mammalian brain. Um, but we can see it's, it's structurally different. And, and the lack of understanding means we can't simply take this network and apply it to engineering problems because we need to understand it first. And that, if you like, is one of the, the major goals in the HBP is to try and understand what these networks are doing. Um, if you want to run computer models of these systems, then for an artificial network, the uh, hardware of choice is something like this. This is an NVIDIA GPU. Uh, GPUs are very good at dense matrix operations. Uh, this box consumes about three kilowatts. Um, we're learning how to compute effectively with lower precision in artificial networks, uh, but it's still fairly heavy duty computing machinery. If instead we want to model more biological uh, spiking networks with the sparse connectivity that's typical of biological systems, then the standard computer of choice is a supercomputer. Um, and now we can communicate with spikes uh, but the energy budget has gone from kilowatts to megawatts. However, if we build special purpose hardware that is closer to uh, operating the way the brain operates, then we can reduce that power dramatically. And this particular example is, is the IBM True North chip, where we can maintain real time in the simulation, so run at the same speed as the biology, which is generally not possible on supercomputers, and the megawatts have now become milliwatts. So we've reduced the power consumption by something like nine orders of magnitude. So you can see there's a huge range of, of efficiencies at work here, um, but still a, a difficult problem of, of matching a particular application to a particular solution. And this is still a relatively unexplored space that the HPP is contributing uh, towards the exploration of this space. Now, there is commercial interest in neuromorphic computing, although it's at a rather preliminary state. So um, there's been interest in IBM's True North systems. Um, Intel has moved into the game with its Loihi chip, although Loihi is not an official product. You can't start a company based around use of Loihi. Um, it's a research prototype that's available for academic groups to experiment with. Um, and there are also small scale startups such as uh, Innovation, um, 
which I think has changed its name as a spin out from Zurich. Um, Chronocam again has changed its name as a spin out from the Paris Vision Institute. And even in Manchester, we had a, a startup called Mindtrace that was looking at event based um, applications uh, using Spinnaker as its development platform in its early stages. So there's venture capital and industrial investment going into this space. But the state as today is that what's really lacking is a compelling demonstration of the commercial viability of neuromorphic technology. So many people are looking for this, um, but the killer application um, is yet to emerge. There are some quite promising um, pointers, uh, but we aren't quite that, there yet. So it, it, it is primarily um, a research area with a number of people investing in commercial developments around it. So um, what are we doing at Manchester? Well, I told you about the Spinnaker project. At the start of this project, we set ourselves the goal of seeing what we could do if we put a million mobile phone processors into one big computer and connected them in a way that enabled them to support real-time biological models at biological levels of connectivity. From the outset, it's clear that even with a million processors, you don't get close to the scale of the human brain. Optimistically, you might get to about 1%, or as I prefer to think of it, 10 whole mice. Um, the mouse brain conveniently is a thousand times smaller than the human brain. But even that now probably looks optimistic and we can probably just about do a whole mouse brain on a million processors in Spinnaker. We started with the silicon design. That's the core skill in my group. And um, the chip, which is about a square centimeter, took about uh, five years and 40 person years of effort to put together. And this largely took place between 2006 and 2010. Um, this is packaged with an industry standard memory chip. If you look at the top left of this slide, the darker rectangle is the memory die and the lighter square um, chip underneath is the Spinnaker chip. So we package the compute and the memory in the same package, which comes out uh, looking like the package shown at the bottom left of this slide. Uh, it's about two centimeters square. And we can use that to tile an arbitrary two-dimensional surface um, to build machines of, of considerable size. So we've taken that basic chip, we've attached 48 of them to a circuit board. Uh, so that circuit board has 864 of these processor cores on it, just under a thousand. And then we can assemble those boards into large machines. And the largest machine is the million core machine at Manchester, which provides the eBrain service through the HBP. And this has been online running that service since the end of March 2016. It started with half a million cores. And then in November 2018, um, it was doubled to the full million cores. And we've supported something like 450 remote users on this machine and run something like 5 million jobs. So it's kept reasonably busy um, supporting that service although it's, uh, it's not overloaded. So if you submit a job, you don't really have to wait um, for the results to come back. The response is pretty much instantaneous. That isn't the only Spinnaker machine. Um, we've been loaning and then selling Spinnaker boards um, to other research labs around the world. And this map shows their current or global distribution. Um, well, it's got most of them on, not quite all of them. There are something like 100 boards in use. Um, about half of those are smaller boards with just four nodes on, which are useful for training and small scale robotics experiments. And about half of them are the larger boards uh, that I've described with 48 packages on. And one of those boards will support a neural network of the scale of a small insect brain. So something like Drosophila um, can be supported by one of those boards. And if you want to go to larger systems, then you need a multi-board system. And some of the systems out there are 
multi boards, but the uh, the only really big one is the one in Manchester. So what can you do with this machine? Well, let's have a look. Um, the target application that uh, informed the design of Spinnaker was to contribute to brain science, so computational neuroscience. And in that area, there have been uh, a number of significant results. Uh, perhaps the most significant recently has been um, the real-time uh, implementation of the cortical microcircuit um, on Spinnaker. And this was the first implementation of that model that ran in biological real time. I think the high performance computing and GPU folk are, uh, are catching up, um, but we're now in the process of scaling this up to a multi-area cortical microcircuit where um, we expect this will continue to operate in real time. Uh, and it'll just, uh, we scale up just by applying more boards to the problem. So the compute load at any particular processor doesn't go up. We just use more processors and we've got a lot of them. So we can um, scale up to quite large cortical systems through that route. The system isn't limited just to simple uh, static spiking networks. Um, we've also had people use the machine for neuromodulator based experiments. So in, in this case, serotonin, um, looking at uh, uh, simulating serotonergic modulation um, and, uh, and, and more complex phenomena. So that's a couple of examples of applications in computational neuroscience. Um, the next dimension we've pursued is uh, theoretical neuroscience where Spinnaker can be used to test hypotheses of neural function. And one of the more abstract hypotheses that's emerged is the idea of neural networks that use stochasticity to solve complex problems. Um, in this case, constraint satisfaction problems where the example here is Sudoku. And uh, this is a stochastic network that solves the hardest class of Sudoku problems most of the time in uh, about 10 seconds, um, which is a lot faster than I can do it, but then I don't have the rules of Sudoku hardwired into my brain. And the same approach can be shown to, to solve map coloring problems and icing spin systems and so on. Um, so that's a fairly abstract uh, theoretical model. Uh, there are also theories of, of structural plasticity. Um, and this is uh, our host's work um, on, on looking at how removing and reconnecting neurons uh, can enable those neurons to, to learn patterns that they see without any supervision. Um, so this is probably best illustrated in these images where you can see a network that's being shown uh, a sequence of handwritten digits representing the digit zero. And what you can see is that the connections that emerge from exposure to those inputs over time uh, begin to capture some kind of average representation uh, of that digit. And uh, structural plasticity is known to happen in the brain um, and to be one of the important mechanisms of learning. More recently, um, a very interesting algorithm has emerged from the theoretical group at TU Graz called EPROP, and this has been implemented on Spinnaker. And, and this particular example is of a mouse uh, deciding whether it should turn left or right at the end of a corridor. Um, the traditional way of doing this would be to use an algorithm called backpropagation through time which requires that the mouse experiences one transit of the corridor um, and then the world stops while time runs backwards and, and the learning accumulated gets uh, implemented in the network. Whereas with EPROP, uh, time continues to run forward and the mouse learns in real time how to take the correct decision at the end of the corridor. So a few examples there from theoretical neuroscience. Um, the other obvious application area, because Spinnaker is a real-time system, is in neuro-robotics, uh, using neural networks on Spinnaker to control robots. And uh, there are some interesting examples in this space. Um, one of these is work at um, 
the Auckland University of Technology in New Zealand, uh, where they've been using Spinnaker to classify electrical signals to implement real-time control of prosthetics. So um, this, this may not be what you think of when I say robotics, but of course a, a prosthetic limb is, is a sort of uh, a robot component uh, of a human body um, and understanding what the neural systems are saying is important in order to apply the right controls to that limb. And um, looking slightly more like a conventional robot, um, there's also been work carried out on uh, looking at particular neural systems on the ICUB robot. There is an event-based ICUB robot at IIT in Genoa. And an example here is vestibular ocular reflex in the ICUB robot, uh, having the eyes track objects that they're looking at um, in order to keep that object as the focus of attention. So um, those are some examples of applications of Spinnaker. Of course, those three different areas are, are um, of interest to each other and um, they inform each other. So, so what we learn in one, we can often apply in another. That's um, what I want to say about Spinnaker One. Um, for the last few minutes of this talk, I just want to say a little bit about what's coming next. So this is Spinnaker Two, which is um, very much based on the same architectural principles as Spinnaker One, um, but is exploiting advances in semiconductor technology over the last 10 years to deliver a, a much denser system. And this is being co-developed by my group in Manchester and uh, the group at TU Dresden in Germany. And where Spinnaker One has 18 processors on a chip, Spinnaker Two will have 152 and all the other system parameters have to scale up in proportion. The key component on Spinnaker 2 is the quad processing element. So that's a, a sub area of the chip and the chip mainly comprises cut and paste repeats of this. And that QPE has been uh, fully designed, laid out and implemented on prototype chips, um, which uh, have been tested and are still being tested to um, reduce the risks involved in building the big chip, which is quite expensive to fabricate. If we look at what's in the Spinnaker 2 processing elements, we can see quite a lot of lessons that have been learned from Spinnaker 1 being applied to enhance uh, the system on Spinnaker 2. Um, one example of this is each processor on Spinnaker 2 will be tunable for its voltage and frequency. This is called dynamic power management. And what we've shown is that we can change the dynamic power management setting on an individual time step of, of a millisecond or 0.1 millisecond. We can choose the voltage and frequency for that core to be proportionate to the workload that it has to get through in the following time step. So that gives us very fine grain power optimization. Spinnaker One was designed on the principle that individual neurons and their synapses all live on a particular processor. What we found is that sharing the workload across multiple processors increases the capability of the system a lot. So Spinnaker Two has much greater provision for memory sharing. We're putting a multiply accumulate accelerator on Spinnaker Two so that it can implement uh, conventional artificial neural nets as well as neuromorphic systems. Um, and so this is, if you like, Spinnaker 2's neural network accelerator, um, the multiply accumulate unit. And we're putting accelerators on for what we've identified as key functions on Spinnaker 1. And these include slightly obscure things such as very high quality random number generators um, and also exponential and log accelerators. The Processing elements are connected through a network on chip and we have efficient spike communication over that network as well as system level functions. And finally, at the more arcane hardware level, um, the silicon technology uses adaptive body biasing and this enables us to compensate for the fairly large degree of process variation you get in manufacturing of this kind of uh, chip technology. And it, it, if you like, if you if you look at the 
the Gaussian distribution representing the output of the manufacturing, this adaptive body biasing um, significantly reduces the variance that you will see in that distribution in use. One of the early results that's come from Spinnaker 2 prototypes is, is, is itself quite interesting. Um, this is another example of synaptic plasticity, which is using um, an algorithm called deep rewiring to find which are the key connections in a standard network, Lynette 300-100. And what this work demonstrated was that on a, a simple benchmark um, that close to state-of-the-art accuracy could be maintained in a network where um, 99 out of 100 connections had been dropped. So the memory structure required to hold the connectivity information was reduced from um, over a megabyte to 36 kilobytes. Um, and there was something like 100 times energy reduction for training um, compared uh, on the Spinnaker 2 prototype compared with a conventional computer. And I think this, this idea of sparse connectivity is, is going to be quite important um, in neuromorphics, but also in, in general computational modeling of biological systems. Biological networks are always sparsely connected, whereas artificial nets are frequently densely connected. And this is showing that that sparse connectivity um, doesn't necessarily lose you anything as long as you keep the right 1% of connections. You can't keep a random 1%, you have to keep the right 1%. So um, with that, I'll, I'll conclude what I've been telling you. Um, the Spinnaker system has been 20 years in conception and in fact now more than 10 years in construction. It's quite widely used by research groups around the world. We have achieved the original target of putting a million cores into a machine and we can sustain biological real time across that machine. And the Human Brain Project is supporting uh, software development and offering that machine as a service as part of the eBrains research infrastructure. In parallel with that development, industrial AI has uh, exploded onto the scene using second generation, i.e. non-spiking neural nets. And there's a kind of expectation that these two threads will begin to converge and there'll be quite a lot they can learn from each other. In particular, neuromorphics may have something uh, to offer in terms of radically improving the energy efficiency um, of artificial neural nets. Because Spinnaker is a digital system where neuron and, and synapse models are implemented in software, it's very flexible. So it's an ideal research platform for exploring this space. It may not be the ideal delivery platform for delivering um, applications to end customers, uh, you can probably find a more efficient implementation. But, but when you don't know what you want, uh, flexibility um, is at a premium. When you do know what you want, it's probably time to go and implement it more efficiently. And in this context, um, Spinnaker 2 uh, will be about 10 times better in terms of both functional density and energy efficiency. And finally, if you want to know more about Spinnaker, um, last year, uh, just as the lockdown started, um, we uh, a book emerged on Spinnaker, which uh, Peter and I, between us, have edited, and many of the Spinnaker team and people outside at other institutions have contributed to this. Um, and uh, th this book presents, if you like, the 20 year history of the project to date, uh, including descriptions of, of Spinnaker 2. Um, and this is open access, so if you go and find it on the web, um, the PDF is free to download. And with that, I'll finish and I think um, return control to Peter, uh, who will then marshal the questioning that may follow, I hope.